Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. <laughs> you say, what are you doing with the hat on? We're going to do a word study on fame dissimulation word study. I had the hat on because, brothers and sisters in Christ, I wanted to do this outside a few days ago, and it got super windy. Then God got me busy doing some other things. And then this morning, I wanted to do it outside again. And I get out there, and I'm waiting for the sun to come up just right, and I want to be outside, because I do like being outside. I miss being outside doing videos, uh, Bible studies. And I get out there, and I sit down, and all of a sudden, it's perfectly quiet. It's beautiful outside, and I got everything set up outside, and I'm like, this is great. It's going to be great, Lord. It's going to be great. And I'm sitting there, and then all of a sudden, pow, 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 pow. They're doing work down the hillside, so... You can get frustrated. I do get frustrated sometimes, brother, says Christ. But then it's like, Lord, thy will be done. If you don't want me to do it outside? We'll do it inside. And then inside, God's like, since we're doing it inside, why don't you turn with them? So we're going to try to turn with you to everything. Okay, we're going to be doing a word study in the word feign and a word study in the word dissimulation. God put it on my heart. Okay, so turn to 1 Samuel chapter 21, verse 13. Normally we do tons of scripture, so I just turn to the first one so the Bible's open to encourage you, brothers and Christ, to get your King James Bibles out, have them open, and you can pause the video and turn. But we're going to try to turn, and I pray this isn't a super long video, longer than it needs to be. Okay. But feigned. First thing we're going to start is, is the Webster's 1820 Dictionary. I have it on the computer. I have the book, the book over there. And remember... The Webster's 1828 Dictionary is not the final authority. There's been times I've done studies, and we've done studies together, Brother Says Christ, where I disagree with the definitions. In other words, the definition the Bible was using is not in the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Okay? Sometimes the Webster's 1828 Dictionary will have a definition and use a verse, and I think they're misusing that verse. It doesn't fall under that definition. That being said, I still think it's a great tool to use for, for studying the Word of God. Okay. I used the Webster's 1828 Dictionary a lot when I first started, and over time you start learning words, you start learning definition of words and meanings of words. You learn more than anything that you learn the definition by what's in the context of the Scriptures. The Scriptures will oftentimes will define a word. Okay. So I want to go over some definitions real quick, and then we're going to go through the Scriptures word by word. Every time the word feign is used, we're going to go through the Scriptures and get the context. Okay. And please follow along in your King James Bibles. Follow along. Okay. So definition number one, to invent or imagine. People make up stories. They feign stories in their head. Okay. To form an idea or conception of something not real. It's something that's in the head. Okay. Uh, A little twig from outside. Like I said, it got windy one of the days I wanted to try to do this outside. So forgive me. There was something bulging in the paper. And I was like, what is underneath all the paper? It's a twig from one of my trees. All right. To invent and imagine, to form an idea or conception of something not real. Some people feign stories. Some people, and we'll talk about this as we get through the definition, some people will feign their life to be not as bad as it really is. When they do bad things, they'll downplay it and feign it to be not as bad as it really is when it's bad. Okay? The most important part is coming to God broken and contrite spirit. How many times have you heard people say, I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low down, no good sinner. I'm the chiefest of sinners. I've said that. I, said, I, I meant it with Paul. When Paul says he's the chiefest of sinners, I'm like, Paul, to him, Paul's the chiefest of sinners. To me, I'm the chiefest of sinners. To everyone that comes to the cross broken, they should come to the cross with the, I'm the chiefest of sinners. I'm just as wicked as can be. Okay. But you'll have people that will say that, but then when you start calling them out for their sin and their wickedness, they downplay it. I'm not that bad. I'm not that bad. And you're like, wait a second. One minute over here you're saying you're the chiefest of sinners, but then over here you're trying to downplay your sin. Oh, you're not that bad. That's what this definition is, to invent or imagine. They downplay, they, they, they brainwash themselves to believe a lie that their life really isn't that bad. I'm not that bad. Two, to make a show of, to pretend, to assume a false appearance, to counterfeit. And I forgot to unplug the phone. <laughs> Forgive me, brother, says Christ. 
Like I said, we came inside real quick because I want to get this done. But here it is, definition number two. To make show of, to pretend, to assume a false appearance, to counterfeit. Okay? False appearance. We're going to see this in the scriptures. Okay? Someone pretending to be someone they're not. The Bible talks about wolves in sheep's clothing. I'm a sheep. I'm just like one of you. But they're a wolf. Okay? Three, to re represent falsely. To pretend to form or relate a fictitious, a fictitious tale. To represent falsely. The Bible says that we become, when we get saved, brothers Jesus Christ, we become ambassadors for Jesus Christ. You have some people out there that aren't in Christ Jesus, but they're trying to present, represent falsely. They're trying to pretend to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. But it's not the Jesus Christ of the King James Bible, but they're trying to copy, counterfeit, okay? to represent falsely, to pretend, to form or relate a fictitious tale. Once again, you have a story that isn't real, but in your head, you feign it to be real. You want people to think it's real. Um, People preaching, I, I'm not going to be 100% on it. Telling it, you can tell, you can make up a, a good story like a parable that has a good meaning that can help people. By all means, I'm not against great stories that help people, like parables. Like Paul, uh, 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 Jesus, our Savior, was preaching parables. But a lot of times I find out, a lot of times, men behind the pulpit in these Babel buildings, half their stories aren't true. But they want you to believe it's true. What is that? It's a fictitious tale. It sounds good. It sounds good. It excites the people. I'm going to tell this story. Right? Is it real? Well, what is real? What is truth? Remember Pontius Pilate? What is truth? You know? Yeah, it's true. You know, if it's true to him or if it's true. No, is it a true story or is it a parable? Is it a story that you made up to make a point? There's nothing wrong with making up a story to make a point. But when you stand up there and say, hey, this happened to me and I saw this, and you tell this grand story that just sounds so great, that lines up to what you're teaching, is it true? We're supposed to be about truth, brother says Christ, we're not supposed to be about lies. Verse 4, to dissemble, to conceal. Conceal what? The truth. That's what feigning is, to conceal. Okay? You can conceal the truth. So 1 Samuel 21.13 Okay, 2113. That's our first stop in the King James Bible. So let's get to the Bible and let's start going through the words. So those are the definitions that the Webster's 1828 dictionary has. But like I said, this first time that the feign is used, the Bible defines it. 1 Samuel 2113. And he changed his behavior before them. Who's he? King David. Because if you read verse 12, it says, And David laid up these words in his heart and was sore afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. Okay. King David's on the run from Saul, and he's in a heathen nation, heathen territory, and he goes to a place, and it says here, and he changed his behavior before them, King David, and feigned, he's, not, he's anointed king, but he's not reigning as king yet, and he feigned himself mad in their hands. He feigned himself mad in their hands. So what's feigning them? Is King David mad? No. Mad in their hands, and scrabbled on the doors of the gate, and let his spittle fall down upon his beard. What, is, what does the feign mean? He changed his behavior. Why did he change his behavior? To, see, to, to deceive them into thinking that he's mad. And what they say afterwards, keep reading, it says, Then said Achish unto his servants, Lo, ye see the man is mad. Wherefore then hath he brought him to me? Have I need of madmen? That ye have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? He was fearing for his life. So he feigned himself to be something different when he feared for his life. Uh, it reminds me of the Waldensians. If you ever read about the Waldensians, when they went, they sent people to Rome to be witnesses. And you really had to feign yourself, not that you're ashamed of the Lord, but you had to do things in ways like you had a, a piece of paper with the gospel verse. And you pretend like you picked it up off the ground. When you see someone that seems like they're open to the truth or they're looking for the truth, you had to spiritually discern. And when you see someone that seems like that, you had to act like you picked it up off the ground. You feigned that you picked it off the ground and said, this is a pretty interesting passage. Uh, I, I, what do you make of this? And you give it to that person and then they read it and hopefully it breaks their heart. 
sorrow, brokenness, repentance, and you can lead them to Christ. You had to be a little bit subtle in certain days when the Bible's outlawed, uh, preaching the truth is outlawed. Okay? King David was doing it to save his life. Okay? But you see here, he was feigning himself to be someone else, something he's not. Okay? He was assuming a false appearance. Turn to 2 Samuel 14, the next time it's mentioned. 2 Samuel 14. 2 Samuel 14, verse 2. And Joab sent to Tekoa and fenced thence, and fetched, and fetched thence. I was trying to put both words together. Forgive me. Fetched thence a wise woman and said unto her, I pray thee, feign thyself to be a mourner. What does feign mean? It means to fake. Pretend to be a mourner and put on now mourning apparel and anoint not thyself with oil, but be as a woman that had a long time mourned for the dead. Now, what's this all about? I'll just sum it up real quick. You have uh, Joab and you have Absalom. Absalom killed his, one of his brothers because he raped his sister. Uh, and and he's a, he runs from the presence of King David and he's running and he's, he's in exile. And Job's trying to bring him back from exile, so he has this woman come. If you know the whole story, you can take time to read the whole story. Feigning herself to be a mourner, and she tells a, a tale, a story, that isn't true. And they talk King David into inviting Absalom back. Okay, But you see here, the word feign, what does it mean? To fake. She's faking to be someone she's not, and she gives a fake story. She's feigning a story. Okay. Once again, it means that they're fake. It's not real. She's not really mourning. That story she gives King David is not true, but it's got a meaning, but it's not true. Turn to 1 Kings 14.5. 1 Kings 14.5. 1 Kings 14.5. And the Lord said unto Ahijah, Behold, the wife of Jeroboam cometh to ask a thing of thee for her son, for he is sick. The wife of Jeroboam, very wicked man, Jeroboam. So she's coming to ask Ahijah, who's a prophet, no, is our son going to live? You know? For he is sick. Thus and thus shalt thou say unto, for it shall be when she cometh in that she feign herself to be another woman. You see, Jeroboam started going after false gods, and instead of going to his gods, he sent his wife and told her to pretend to be someone else and see if our son will live through this man of God. And as we're going to see here, when it says, feigned herself to be another woman, she's not trying to deceive Ahijah. What Jeroboam, through his wife, is trying to do is he's trying to deceive God. You know how many people do that today? A lot. They think they can feign themselves as good men, and right, we're gonna, I'm getting ahead of myself, but they, they think they can deceive God. And that's what's going on here. Verse 6, and God told him, he said, hey, Jeroboam, hey, Ahijah, wife of Jeroboam's coming in, but she's going to try to pretend to be someone else. Verse 6, and it was so when Ahijah heard the sound of her feet as she came in at the door, that he said, come in, thou wife of Jeroboam. Why feignest thou thyself to be another? For I am sent to thee with heavy tidings. And then you read the story and tell them that their, ch their child is going to die. Okay, and, you know, but here it is, Fainest. What is Fainest talking about? She's faint. She's pretending to be someone she's not. And she's going to have this story that it's partly true because she has a son, but she's trying to hide the fact that she's Jer it's Jeroboam's son and that she's the wife of Jeroboam. Mm -hmm. Assuming a false appearance to represent falsely. Because if she represented Jeroboam, they, they're afraid they're going to get bad news because Jeroboam's a wicked man. He's given into idolatry and wickedness and he's turned his back on God. But if she feigns herself to be a, a good woman that, that loves the Lord, maybe they'll get good news. You see how that works? A lot of people do that today. They feign themselves to be godly people when they're not, because they want good things, they want good news. But the most important part that I want to point out for that is, is that, like once again, 
they weren't trying to deceive Ahijah. Ultimately, they were trying to, please, uh, trying to deceive God. And there's a lot of people today, because the whole point of this study is we're going to get into it about false converts. Okay, people that are false brethren, as the Bible says. Wolves in sheep's clothing. They think they're deceiving God. Oh no, I'm deceiving God, the, you know, God's people, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ. People who are in Christ Jesus, our Lord, has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. Those are the four definitions of being in Christ Jesus. Oh, I'm just deceiving these people, ha, ha, ha. No, they actually think they're deceiving God. Very prideful people. Okay? It took a lot, instead of coming to him, instead of coming to Elijah, Ahijah, and falling on their knees and saying, we were wrong, first and foremost, coming to God saying, we were wrong, get rid of the false gods like they did in the Old Testament, get rid of all the false gods, get rid of all these priests that aren't Levites, and get back to doing, I hope I have the right story about the Levites, but get back to Levites being the priests, get back to doing things God's way, to please God, uh, repent in dust and ashes, you, you rip your clothes and repent in dust and ashes. Okay? And come to him and say, "We have, have mercy on us, God. Have mercy on us, God. But instead, it took a lot of pride and, and uh, conniving to try to deceive. Oh, we're going to deceive God. Uh, what does the Bible say? Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, thou shall you also reap. Jeroboam sowed wickedness. He's going to weep with wickedness. Okay? Turn to Nehemiah 6. Next one to choose is Nehemiah 6. Nehemiah 6, 8. Then I sent unto him, saying, There are no such things done as thou sayest, but thou feignest them out of thine own heart. Here's a good example. Thou feignest them out of thine own heart. People make up stories. Okay. I went a little bit too far over here. But uh, 6 8. But once again, the definition of feigness then is not talking about him representing, it's about the story. There's no such things done as thou sayest. He says a story, this is what happened, but he feigns them. In other words, he's. To represent falsely, to pretend, to pretend, to form or relate a fictitious tale. Okay? And I said, there's people that do that. There's people that lie. They downplay their life. My life isn't that bad. My life isn't that bad. I'm not that bad of a person. I didn't do things. I wasn't that awful. Oh, there's no way I was that bad. There's people that do that. There's men, the wolves in sheep clothing, but sometimes even brethren can get in there and get caught up with, I, I want to say something that pleases the crowd, so I'll tell a story that sounds good, and I'll feign us that it's a real story, it's a true story. And it's not a true story. There's nothing wrong with saying, hey, here's a parable. God did some parables, he helped me put this story together as an example for you that you can learn from. There's nothing wrong with doing that. It just becomes wrong when you act, when you start feigning it in your heart that it's real. It's real. There's no such thing as done as you say, but thou feignest them out of thine own heart. One of the biggest things today is we see a lot of false converts, a lot of false Christians, they feign us, oh, I'm saved out of their own heart. They feign us it. They're really deceived. And we try to show them the truth because they, re they refuse to repent. They have this the knowledge... They don't truly have faith, we're going to show it in here, they don't truly have faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. They have the knowledge of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. They don't confess, well, oftentimes they don't confess both in prayer, they don't ask God to save them. And they'll sit there and say, God saved them. But look at this passage, how it says, But thou feignest them out of thine heart. There's no such thing done. God didn't save you. But thou feignest it out of thine own heart. And I'm not trying to be mean. I always try to preach truth to them. I try to preach the gospel. I want to see people get saved. I'm not sitting here going, ha ha, they're false, they're commerce, they're on their way to hell, ha ha. That's not me. I want to see them get saved. But you have all these false religions, Catholicism, Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, all these organized religions, all these different denominations. And even today, yes, you can have some professing Bible believers, King James Bible believers that are on their way to hell. 
Why? Because they faint out of their own heart. They don't really believe it. Because if they believed it and there's truth, they have a love of the truth, I'm getting ahead of myself, and they truly believe it, when you show them the passages on how to truly get saved today, the true plan of salvation, they'll want to do it. They'll want to do it. They want to get saved. They want the truth. Not man's truth. Not their own truth. They want God's truth. Found in the King James Bible. Okay? Let's get to the next one. Psalm 17.1. Psalm 17.1. I'm getting ahead of myself. Please forgive me, brother. Says Christ. We're going to get in. When we hit the New Testament, they're going to give a de definition of it. We're going to go through all the words in the New Testament. But I want to do the whole thing because we want to do the whole study. It's not hard. But we're going to get into the New Testament. It's going to show exactly if, like that's a false convert. That outlines a false convert today. And how, do we, how are people deceived? The Bible says, by good words and fair speech is deceiving the hearts, the hearts, the hearts. I Once again, the heart. Thou faintest out of thy heart, thy own heart. But with, uh, with good words and fair speech is deceiving the hearts of the simple. Simple. People who don't know the Word of God. Who don't know enough of the Word of God to discern between someone who's truly saved and someone who's false. They don't know this book like they should know this book. They don't have their own personal walk strong enough with the Lord to be strong enough to say, Hey, something's not right. I see something out there that's not right. I need to witness to this person. I don't, he claims to be saved, but I need to witness to him again. All right. We're in Psalm 17.1. Turn to Psalm 17.1. And 17.1. Psalm 71, hear my cry, O Lord, attend unto my cry, give ear unto my prayer, that goeth out, that goeth not out of feigned lips, fake lips. In other words, he's praying from the heart, and his, his prayer is genuine. We're get, when we get to the New Testament, you're going to find out that words can be faked. Do you guys remember the story of the publican? And the um, Pharisee and the publican, and Jesus taught, and he said that when thou prayest, do it behind closed doors in the closet. Don't be up there in the synagogues for long prayers and pretenses to be seen of men, to get praise of men. He, King David said, I'm not just praying this prayer to be put on a show, to be seen of men, to say, oh, look, he's just so holy and everything, because look at his prayer, and look how long it is, and the, the words he's used. He's saying it's coming from the heart. It's coming from the heart. It's not fake. Lord, it's not coming from faint lips. Attend to my cry. I'm crying out to you, Lord. In sorrow, in pain, in trouble, in tribulation. I'm crying out to you, Lord. It's real. So the definition of faint here is fake. My prayer isn't fake. I'm not putting on a show. This is really happening, Lord. I'm not making up the story. This is really happening to me, Lord. I need your help. I need your guidance. I need your strength. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. If any of you seek wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not. I need your help, Lord. Prayer. Okay. Turn to Jeremiah 3.10. Jeremiah 3.10. Jeremiah 3.10 So by default, words can be fake. Right? People feign themselves to be something they're not. They can feign stories, you know, downplay things or make up things. They can feign words. Okay. Jeremiah 3.10 Chapter 3, verse 10 And yet for all this... Her treacherous sister Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, but feignedly say, saith the Lord. Feignedly saith the Lord. Remember what Jesus, when he came back, he would say, he got on to the Jews and said, especially the, the religious leaders, he would say, Thou saith, Lord, Lord, why saith thou, Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say? They are all talk and no walk. But faintly saith the Lord. We always talk about this, brothers of Christ, and a lot of the, the, the false converts, false religions, uh, enemies, true enemies of the book, they hate when I always say this. It comes back to being a heart issue. 
It'll always come back to being a heart issue, brothers and sisters in Christ. You can never get away from it. You can try, we read about that, you can try to deceive God, as um, the wife of Jeroboam did. You can try to deceive God, but it always comes down to a heart issue. God looks at the heart. Now, I don't want to butcher it too much, but the verse talks about the, God's words like a double-edged sword, piercing a sunder and dividing a sunder, and knows the thoughts and intents of the heart. With the man's heart, a man, uh, a man, with the man's heart, he believeth unto righteousness. But with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Mouth, heart. Mouth, heart. Words and deed. Okay? Words and deed. But faithfully saith, Lord, they haven't turned to him with their whole heart. God always looks at the heart. They're faking it. They must be in trouble, and they want out of that trouble... But their whole heart hasn't turned back to God. Like I said with Jeroboam, you want God's help? Like when, For today, let's bring it to today, brother says Christ. Your walk with the Lord. Your walk, your life seems to be like it's falling apart and everything's falling apart. Then you'll fall on your knees and say, oh God, I need your help. But do you ever stop to look at why it's falling apart? And say, Lord, I'm sorry. I screwed up there, Lord. I'm so sorry. I screwed up there. I did wrong there. I gave into temptation there. I gave into worldliness there. I tried to be a man pleaser here. Whatever. And fall on your knees in repentance first. And say, Lord, I was wrong. I am so sorry, O Lord. I don't want to make these mistakes again. I need help, O Lord. Then you turn to God saying, Lord, I need help. But you have a lot of people that refuse to repent. For salvation, they refuse to repent in your walk with the Lord. But you'll fall, anytime you get into trouble, I'll fall down. And, Lord, save me! Lord, save me! Oh, come on, Lord, save me! But your heart's not all the way for Him, because if it was, you repent first, forsake, and then ask God to save you. Not for salvation. I'm talking about in the life of a Christian. I've had to do that. Um, right now, I'm dealing with some, some people that I hope they're saved. But Peter Ruckman used to teach this, that the, the, the catching away, the, the day of Christ, that blessed hope, when the body of Christ is caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble, it'll solve all your problems. Uh, that's not what it's supposed to be for, brother says Christ. If you, if you make a huge mess of your life, a huge mess of your life, you need to come to God broken and say, Lord, help me. I don't want you coming back with me in this state. I don't want you coming back and finding me falling flat on my face. I want you coming back and seeing me doing good for you and living for you and doing right for you. And instead of being motivated to repent and forsake and get your heart right with the Lord and live right, people are being told today, just keep looking for that blessed hope with your eyes, not the life you're living, but with your eyes, and it'll solve all your problems. But faintly say the Lord, they haven't come with their heart. Their heart's not for the Lord. Anybody who thinks that the, that the catching away, that they can make a huge mess of their life and the catching away will solve everything, they're sorely mistaken. And please understand what I'm saying, brothers. They forget about the judgment seat of Christ. When God comes back and or comes in the clouds and calls us home, if your life is a huge mess, brothers, like, get it settled now. Get it situated now. Fall on your knees before God now in true repentance. Ask God's help through the Word of God to guide you to clean up your life and get ready. If Jesus came back today, are you ready? But there's a big push among these false Christians, these easy believers that believe in the pre-time of Jacob. They call it pre-trib rapture. Falsely. It's, there's no rapture in the Bible. There, it's called caught up. Uh, that seven-year time period is not called the, tri the Great Tribulation. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. And they believe that, but they make a huge mess of their life, and they're always just sitting there, and instead of coming to God broken and repentance and say, Lord, I'm sorry for the mess I've made. Lord, how do I fix this? And if I can't, Lord, can you, can you give me the strength to fix it and teach me how to fix it, or can you fix it? There's some things I can't fix. Some things only God can fix. And there's some things God will show us in His Word how we can get right with Him. Get this out of your life. Get that out of your life. Start doing this. Start doing that. Okay. I always tell brethren, read the Bible in the morning. Start your day with the Word of God and prayer. End your day with the Word of God and prayer. And at the end of the day, you need to evaluate your day and say, Lord, 
I failed you here. I failed you there. I, you helped me here, Lord. We did great here. This was amazing, Lord. That was amazing. But my mind started to wander at this point, and I started thinking things I shouldn't have thought of. Lord, please forgive me. And it's your time to say, Lord, forgive me. And evaluate your, your day and say, Lord, today was a great day. Or maybe you had one of those times you sat down and say, Lord, today was a bad day. Today was a hard day, and today was a bad day, Lord. I just had a bad day, Lord. Please help me not make the same mistakes again. And tomorrow, help me to live a better day tomorrow. The Bible says that though the outward man perish, the inward man is renewed day by day. There's an old hymn, day by day. Okay? But once again, Brother Sis Christ, I'm sorry to go off on a tangent a little bit, but it's just it's been bugging me a lot lately that, that Peter Ruckman used to teach that. And I love Peter Ruckman. He's a brother in Christ, but he's not the final authority. This is the final authority. Okay? The catching away of the body of Christ is not... Uh, it's a solution that the Bible, Paul says that he may redeem us from this wicked world. That's what the catching way is about, is taking us home and getting us out of here completely and starting the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? Getting us away from this wicked world. It's not supposed to be a solution that I can mess up my life all I want and just destroy my life and my walk with the Lord and just live in sin and wickedness and sin for a season, being lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, the Bible says. And the catching away is going to be, a, it's just going to save me. Now don't get me wrong, it's better than being down here, because Paul says to be with Christ is far better than being down here. But Paul doesn't sit there and say, oh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm still in wickedness and sin and making a mess of my life, and that's why I want to be up there. No, I want to be up there because this world is so wicked. I'm trying to preach truth to this world. They don't want it. And it's far better. You get saved. It's far better to be with Jesus Christ. But why are we still down here? To encourage each other to be a light to this dark world, and to encourage each other to be a bright light to this dark world. Okay? But like I said, it's just it's not the solution. Okay? I always tell brethren, make sure you get your heart right with God. Once again, your heart. You don't want God coming back and your heart isn't right with Him. That's where the Bible says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Is your heart right with God? It's not talking about eternal salvation. It's talking about salvation down here. When you go home to be with God, and you go to stand before Him at the judgment seat of Christ, is He going to say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant? Or is He going to be disappointed in you? I always try to say that. Oh, you're just getting us feeling bad. Brother says Christ, I'm doing this to exhort you. Examine yourself whether you be in the faith. Prove your own self. Make sure you're living a life of Christ. A life of repentance. Like we just read there. What does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? He made into us wisdom. Make sure you fear God, first and foremost. And that you're staining His word and you're hiding His word in your heart. And living it. Okay? I mean, it's righteousness. We talked about ambassadors. How some people can feign themselves. Okay? Make sure that you're a good ambassador for Jesus Christ. That His righteousness is imputed to you, and now you're an ambassador for Jesus Christ. You're supposed to represent what a real Christian is and living a life of Christ. Which leads to the second one, sanctification. Be ye holy, for I am holy. We're supposed to be set apart from this wicked world. But today, the average professing Christian, you can't tell the difference between them and the lost world. Other than a profession of faith. Their talk... They're all talk, but no walk. Their walk doesn't line up with the book. The walk, their walk doesn't line up with God's Word. And then, redemption. We've taught this, Brother Christ, when you're looking for the redemption of the purchased possession, it's not something that you just sit here looking for. My life's a mess, but I'm just going to sit here and look for it. No. If you're truly looking for that catching away, you're looking for it with the life that you're living. Is my life right with God? Is my heart right with God? Is my life right with God? He can come back any day now. Am I right with God? That's what it means to really truly look for that blessed hope. Sorry to get off on a little bit of the tangent there. But right here in Jeremiah 3.10, they faintly say the Lord. They haven't turned to Him with their whole heart. And today you have a lot of false, I believe a lot of false converts, that they faintly say Lord. But they haven't given their whole heart to Him. They still love their sin. They still love their worldliness. Getting ahead of myself. Turn to Luke. Now we're getting into the New Testament. Well, it's still the Old Testament, but we're still going to use Luke. 
This is in the Old Testament, but we're going to start here and start lining up evidences of people, why they're so fake and false today. How you can point them out, okay? Feigned. Luke 20, 20. Luke 20, 20. And people always get on to us, oh, it's not that big of a deal, it's not that big of a deal. If people say they're saved, they're saved. It's no big deal. Just, you know, we all just need to hold hands and sing Kumbaya. And like I said, their number one way of trying to deceive you is with good words and fair speeches, deceiving the hearts of the simple. And their good words and fair speeches, remember we talked about this in the last study we did. It's not about the Word of God being the final authority. It's the message that matters. It's not the Word that matters, the perfect written Word of God. It's the message, man's words, good words, and fair speeches. And they deceive the hearts of the simple. Luke 20, 20. And they watched him and sent forth spies, spies, which should feign themselves just men, that they might take hold of his words, that so they might deliver him unto the power and authority of the governors. And this is where he's being tested. They ask him, is it uh, lawful to give tribute to Caesar and everything? But look what it says there, brothers says Christ. It says, which should feign themselves just men. You mean you can fake righteousness? You can fake being just? Good words, fair speeches. That's how I'm going to keep using that verse because that's how they fake it. This is what real righteousness is, but how do you, can you tell if their righteousness is real? Right here. Is Jesus' righteousness imputed to them? Remember, there's two definitions for righteousness. There's righteousness in the Bible that talks about like sinless perfection. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understand it. There's none that seeketh after God. They've all gone together, gone out of the way. They've together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. There's none righteous. Talking about sinless being sinless. Only Jesus was righteous. Only Jesus was sinless. Then there's the definition of righteousness as being right in God's eyes. In the Old Testament, you had your sins covered, not taken away, and you could live right in God's eyes. And there's men called that were called righteous. King David was called righteous. Okay? So there's righteousness saying, my heart is right with God. And then there's righteousness as far as being sinlessly perfect. I'm not sinlessly perfect. I'm not righteous when it comes to sinlessly perfect. But there's people out there that will feign themselves to be right, having a right heart in God's eyes. How can you tell if that's true or not? We have the Word of God here. What are their deeds? The Bible says, by their fruits ye shall know them. So if you had the notepad or paper, I'd say, write this down. Here's the first step. They, they can feign themselves to be just men. Today, you can have people that look holy and godly in and, and these religions. They put on the garb and they have all these ceremonies and everything. And boy, they can put on this big pomp and show. Okay? And they can feign themselves to be just men. Now, the Bible also says... Okay, that Satan, don't you remember Satan? Satan is tra transforms himself into an angel of light. And I don't want to get into it too much, but the angel of light. Why is it an angel of light? Angel or men? They look like men, okay? Jesus is the angel of the Lord. He wants to copy God. He wants to be God. Jesus is God. So he tries to copy him by saying, I'm going to transform into an angel of light. Light, knowledge, wisdom. What is Jesus called? He says, I'm the light of the world. All right? He's the light of the world. Satan is a counterfeit. He feigns himself to be Jesus Christ in the future. But he has that, the Bible in, in the book of jo 1 John, it talks about how that antichrist spirit is already in the world today. Okay? He's already, all these false Christs out there, these false Jesuses, is Satan posing as Jesus Christ in all these false religions. But that's not the part I'm trying to get at. It says that he, no, for no marvel, for his ministers are also transformed into the ministers of righteousness. They feign themselves to be just men. How do you know they're feigning it? Because the next part says, whose end shall be according to their works. 
Those who are lost are under the law of sin and death, and when they stand before God someday at the great white throne, it's, they're going to be judged on their works. And if there's so much as one sin, they're going into the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. Okay. They're going to be judged according to their sin. They're not truly saved. But they put on this show, they transform themselves into the ministers of righteousness. Okay. I put in my notes here about the Pharisee again. What's meant? The Pharisee and the and the scro uh, the Pharisee and the publican. Pharisee and the publican. Where the Pharisee set up there, I'm not as other men are, and he goes through all these works. But God looks at the heart, and you look at that publican, and he's like, he wouldn't even lift up his head, eyes to to, the, to heaven, but smote on his breath and said, "Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner." Okay. One of the biggest things is you'll have all these people that like to pretend and put on a show of feigning themselves to be just men. Oh yeah, I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, we're a sinner, we're all sinners. But when you actually back them in a corner with their personal sins, not a generalized idea of what sin is, but their specific personal sins, their attitude changes. Their whole, they're no longer trying to act like righteous men. You start seeing right through them when you see the Bible and say, Hey, wait a minute. You don't line up with this and you call them out specifically and personally. They start turning against the Word of God. Okay? But you see here, they can feign themselves just men. 2 Corinthians 6.6. 6. Turn to 2 Corinthians 6.6. 6. Does it stop there? No, it doesn't. 2 Corinthians 6.6. 6. There's a whole... Uh, I asked the Lord, Brother Says Christ, sometimes, I said, Lord, in these last days, I said, Lord, if it wasn't for your word, and even at first glance, it's, even with all the studying I've done, Brother Says Christ, hiding God's word in my heart, my own struggles with the flesh, my own struggles with the world, my own struggles with Satan, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. I look out there, and it's still, in these last days, it's still not like I can look and go, that person's false, just by looking at them, that person's false. The counterfeits today look so close. Okay? So close. You look online, it's hard to tell the truth online because it's just words. How are we supposed to tell? The Bible says, by their fruits you shall know them. You can't see how they're living online. If you're watching this, I'm pointing at my computer. If you're watching, you can't see how people live online. It used to be you had house churches and you came together and you met together. And you lived around each other, and you could see how people are living, and you could tell. It's a lot easier to tell a false convert from someone who's real. But we're so spread out today, most of our fellowship is online. Because we're so spread out today. And it's like, it's hard to tell. But they can fake being just men. Okay. What about 2 Corinthians 6.6? 6, 6? 2 Corinthians 6.6. 6. By pureness... By knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned. Love unfeigned? You mean someone can fake love? How do they fake love? It's mostly with words. Sometimes it's with gifts. Oh, I give my... I don't want to go too far that, but I was going to say something, but I'll hold it back. But I said, you can give gifts. So, oh, he, he bought this for me. He must really love me. That doesn't determine whether someone really loves you. Okay? The Bible talks about charity. Charity is self-sacrifice. Love is part of charity. But the Bible says, uh, there's no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. Okay? I've, I've got conf I got frustrated there for a while, but it's Christ, and now I'm at the point where, Lord, that's just the world we live in, and I need to not be like that. I've had a lot of people, I believe some are saved, I believe some are false converts, but I've had a lot of people in my lifetime, I've been saved for 10 years now, I've had a, nine and a half, 10 years, I've had a lot of people that profess, have a profession of faith that said, I love you brother, I love you brother, I'm here for you brother, and now they treat me like I'm a, a servant of Satan, they have such hate, bitterness and hate. And disdain towards me? What is that? Well, I think I believe a lot of them, it's love unfeigned. I mean feigned, it's feigned love, taking it backwards. 
It's feigned love. Their love was fake. I remember in one of my studies, I talked to you just kind of venting a little bit. So please forgive me, brothers of Christ. I vent a little bit sometimes in my studies. Um, I was talking to you about how, you know, people would say that. I love you. And it's become like a salutation. It's just something you say in passing. You know, we go by somebody and say, how are you doing? And we keep walking. I've had people do that to me. How are you doing? And keep walking. There, it's a question. And when you ask a question, it's meant to be answered. You need to stop and wait for an answer. But they don't treat it like a question. It's just become like a salutation. Same thing with the, saying, with, with the word love. Today, the lost world has no clue what real love is. And these false converts, I was one of them, and these Babel buildings with the easy believism have no clue what real love is. But love has just become something that is fate. It's not real. But once again, most of the time, the love is fate in words. It's, it's words or like they try to bribe you with gifts. But their actions what matter, the fruit. True love is self-sacrifice. When you love someone enough, you're willing to give of yourself. You're willing to sacrifice your time to spend time with them, to pray with them, to talk with them. Uh, you spend uh, donations. It's not a gift, but if let's say you're poor and you've got this money and you're going to fix something on your house and then someone over here has a, a brother in Christ over here has a medical emergency and they don't have money to buy medicine and you say, you know what, I'm going to forego, forego fixing my house so they can have medicine and pray that the Lord will help me in the future. But it's called sacrifice. True love comes with sacrifice. Now, brothers and sisters Christ, there's times where we have to break fellowship with brethren that have fallen away. They start, uh, it talks about um, they've departed from the faith and give themselves over to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And we have to say, okay, I can't fellowship with you. You, can put, you have to put people out because they start turning on this book. You have to say, I, I can't fellowship with you because you have brethren that get back into sin and wickedness and I can't, I can't fellowship with you. But the Bible says you're to admonish them as a brother. You're to love them as a brother. There's supposed to be a door there for them to come back. They repent, they forsake, they get back lined up with the book, they get that sin out of their life, they can come back in. But today, people get kicked out. It's almost like permanent. You're, you're anathema, you know. The, you know you're, the, you're cursing them and kicking them out. And everyone that gets kicked out, they're automatically lost. And you just have a lot of hate, a lot of anger, a lot of fighting and everything among the body of Christ and division. And it's like, no, the Bible says you to put them out, but there's supposed to be a door for them to be able to come back in when they get their heart right with God. But a lot of people kick them, kick them out, slam the door, bolt it all, bolt the door, put the wood beam down, everything, and, and make it where they can't ever come back. Uh, brothers and sisters Christ, we're supposed to love our brothers and sisters of Christ. Even if you have to put them out, every brother that I believe is saved, that has broken fellowship with me, or for some reason got into the world and just disappeared, being like Demas, having forsaken me, having loved this present world, or you have a disagreement like Barnabas and Paul did, I still believe Paul was in the right, but Barnabas goes his way, you know. Every brother and sister in Christ that I ever fellowship with, that I mean face-to-face -face with Skype and everything, and got letters and my board over there, I still pray for them. I still think about them. I still love my brothers and sisters in Christ. I still pray for them. I say it again. I, I mean, I said it twice, but I, I pray for them. Okay? We're supposed to love. We're supposed to have love that's unfeigned. It's not fake. Turn to 1 Timothy 1.5. We're going to come across another verse about fake love. But turn to 1 Timothy 1.5. So, they can feign themselves to be just men. They can fake love. They fake righteousness. They fake love. Their love doesn't line up with the Bible. It always comes down to this, brothers and Christ. I'm always going to point this out. By good words and fair speeches. How they deceive people with their words. Because it doesn't line up with this. The righteousness doesn't line up with this. True love doesn't line up with the Word of God. What the Word of God says true love is. Because right? in John it talks about loving your brothers and sisters in Christ, but today, brethren are just every man for himself. I'm part of this clique. I'm part of this group over here. I'm part of that group over there. And I only have to love the people in my group. No, we're supposed to love the brothers and sisters in Christ as a whole, the body of Christ as a whole. And that love is our actions. 
Love is not a feeling, it's an act of your will. It's how you act, how you treat people. That determines whether you love them or not. But today, you're told to ignore the actions, it's just the words. If someone says they're righteous, they're righteous. If someone says they love you, they love you. What about this one? 1 Timothy 1.5 1 Timothy 1.5 1 Timothy 1.5 Now, the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. Once again, it comes back to being a heart issue. Brothers and Christ, there's just no way to get around that. God looks at the heart. You need to look at your heart. When Paul says, examine whether you be in the faith, it's not necessarily just this, which it is. You're going through the Word of God. But what does the Bible say? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. When you're examining the scriptures to make sure that, you know, that you have it in your heart, what does that mean? That you're living it. That you're abiding by it. That you're standing for the truth. Charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Wait, wait. You're saying that you can fake faith? Faith can be faked? Oh no, faith can't be fake. Then why does he say that your faith has to be unfeigned? In other words, it's not fake. 1 Corinthians uh, uh, 15, uh, I think it's verse 2, talks about lest you have believed in vain. Then he goes to the gospel over again. Why? Because you have people that, in words, they're denying the, the resurrection, uh, but also in action, they're denying the resurrection. Now, I taught this. You can deny the resurrection in words. But you can also deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the life that you're living. If there's no new birth, there's no new creature in Christ Jesus, there's no new man, then you're denying the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay? The Bible talks about it. It talks about uh, false brethren. Wolves in sheep's clothing. They can say things. People can parrot things. I've had people that follow, let's say, Peter Ruckman. Brian Denlinger at King James Video Ministries, when it was King James Video Ministries, not the Brian of today, but the Brian that was King James Video Ministries, okay? Uh, I've had people that could parrot them, and 33rd Book, Sam Gibb, David Daniels, those are the five main guys that I watched, and even me, when I started getting in, they started parroting some of the things I said. But when you back them into the corner, because their life doesn't line up with their faith, their profession of faith, their life doesn't line up with it. When you back them into a corner with their life and how they're living and their actions and their deeds, their words change. They turn on the truth. They turn on what they, those men taught. And they start teaching, they start saying doctrines of devils. And what it is, is they always believed the doctrines of devils. They always believed falsehood. But they're putting on a show. Faith can be faked. Uh, I knew a woman that she came over to, King, when it was King James Video Ministries, years and years ago, probably eight years ago. She'd be on there saying that, yes, the plan of salvation that Brian taught, repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. And after God saves you, there's a changed life. If there's no changed life, if there's no new birth, you didn't follow these steps. Because anyone who fo truly followed these steps here... And we talk about it. it's the heart. It's a heart issue. There's going to be a guaranteed change life. And she's like, oh yes, I believe this. Yes, this is great. This is great. But she secretly was trying to push people to go to other channels. Okay. Robert Breaker, I'll go ahead and say it. She was pushing everyone, trying to push me. To go to, you need to check out Robert Breaker's channel. It's a great man of God, Robert Breaker's channel. I didn't know it. I didn't have time. I, I just didn't have time. I'm, I'm already following these five men. And I think uh, I le always leave out ex-Catholics for Christ. I was watching them for a little while until they just, when they got backed into a corner with, is it going to be this? Is the Word of God number one? Or the world number one? Is the wisdom of God what you're going to follow? Or the wisdom of man? They chose wisdom of man and the world. And, and when it came to the Trinity, there is no Trinity. It's the Godhead of the King James Bible. I mean, it's a whole other thing. But she's pushing. I didn't have time. Later on down the word, uh, later on down the road, if I can say it right, 
Later on down the road, I come to find out Robert Brinker teaches a different gospel than Brian Denlinger taught. I mean, seriously, stop and let that sink in. I'm not saying that... You, what I'm saying is, is, how can you do that? I don't understand how people can do that, Brother Sir. When I find out that I'm following someone who teaches a different gospel than I preach, I'm done with them. But over, when it come to find out over on Robert Breaker's channel, when it's only believe, repentance is a work, prayer is a work, it's only believe, she was over there saying, amen, that's the true gospel. But when she was over on Brian's channel, she was uh, Brian Denlinger's channel, King, when it was King James Video Ministries, once again, she was saying over there, oh no, amen, it's repentance towards God, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. What is that? She was faking faith with her words. Over here, she believes this. Over here, believes that. I remember a man up in, in Canada that he, I call him a fish out of water. Okay? Uh, the Bible talks about, has his number, it talks about being tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. The wind's blowing this way, he's going that way. If the wind's blowing that way, he's going that way. He has no foundation. When he's with this group, this is what he believes, what that group believes. Then when he's with that group over here, it's what that group believes. When he's over here with this group, it's what this group believes. If he's over here, he's a chameleon. What is that? That's fake faith. When he's here, he has a faith, a profession of faith, but it's fake. And to, honestly, to this day, that, 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 I, don't even think, I don't even think he's a brother. I honestly don't. That man that's in Canada that I met, that was supposed to be a brother in Christ, to this day, I don't know what he actually believes. I don't. He's bounced out from so many different groups that believe so many different things, he doesn't know how to stand. He's a chameleon. That woman that's trying to get everybody over, come to find out, she actually believed the false gospel of head belief alone. Faith alone, head belief. No repentance, no prayer. You don't confess both in prayer and you don't ask God to save you. That's what she really believed. What was she doing? She was, being a, she was hiding. She was assuming a false appearance when she was under Brian Denlinger's channel uh, um, back when it was uh, King James Video Ministries. She was assuming a false appearance. Here we see, Brother Says Christ, that faith can be faked. But how can you tell? It's all talk. Okay. It's all talk. And for the most part, how, how do people mostly get deceived? Because their faith doesn't line up with this book. Chapter and verse. Chapter and verse. One of the biggest things that screw people up is they're not dispensational. I put out a video recently by a brother in Christ because I got asked a question about dispensational teaching. It's like, I have a study out on it. I, I know a lot of the brethren do. Uh, when you have someone who's non-dispensational, they're going to be completely messed up. They're going to be completely messed up. Okay. But you see there that faith can be faked. Turn to 2 Timothy 1.5. I found this interesting. 1 Timothy 1.5 talks about faith unfeigned. Then you go to 2 Timothy 1.5. The second letter, he has to go through it again and say, hey, it's, it's chapter 1 verse 5. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and my mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that it is in thee also. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith, faith can be faked, brothers and sisters in Christ. Fake faith can be faked. That's why we're supposed to be hiding God's word in our heart. That's why the Bible says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Okay? We're to try people by this book. And if you don't know the Word of God, if you're not rightly dividing, and you don't know the Word of God, how are you supposed to tell the difference between someone who's trying like wolf in sheep's clothing and someone who's genuine? We read there in 2 Timothy, Paul saying, This person's genuine. Well, how would Paul know that? He has the Holy Spirit, and it's the spoken word back then, in Paul's time. It's the spoken word. Okay. But a lot of times in the Bible, we keep seeing it. Prove yourself. Prove your own selves. Prove. 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 How can you tell the fake from the real? This is how, right here. Do they line up with this book? Does their life line up with this book? Not just the words. Does their life line up with this book? 
Turn to 1 Peter 1.22. 1 Peter 1.22. First Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Seeing ye have purified your, purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. Notice it says purifying your souls. Ye have purified your souls. I believe that Peter, I honestly believe 1st, 2nd, 3rd Peter is talking about the Jews that go into the time of Jacob's trouble. Today, the Holy Spirit, through God, purifies our soul. Okay? But in obeying the truth, the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. But you see they're unfeigned. Okay. Okay. Now, here, real quick. When it says, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth, okay, in obeying the truth, okay, I, I take it back a little bit, in obeying the truth, our souls get purified when we obey the gospel. What's the gospel? The truth. And what's the gospel about? The way, the truth, and the life. Who's that? Jesus Christ. Okay, forgive me. Uh, through the Spirit, through the Spirit, God opens this book, cleans up your life. Unto unfeigned love of the brethren, unfeigned love, brothers says Christ. Once we see it again, love can be faked. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. The Bible talks about the flatterer, flattering with your lips. I didn't put anything to this down, but talk about how people can flatter with their lips. And you think, oh, that person loves me with their words. But what about their deeds? I always keep pushing this, Brother Christ, and I'll keep pushing it until God calls me home. Words and deed need to line up. When words and deed don't line up, and you call them out for their deeds... Their words change every time. Every time. And why? Because they're being called out for being fake, for being false. And now, that woman that I talked about that was trying to get people over to a false gospel, she came into a group pretending to be one of you, and I believe the gospel that you guys believe, but she was trying to get them over to a false gospel. Right? But she had faint look. Oh, I love you, brothers, says Christ. I, mean, I love you, brothers. I love you, sisters. She was fake. 100% fake. Right. Turn to 2 Peter 2 3. So, to sum it up a little bit more, is you can feign just men. They can fake righteousness. They can fake faith. Good words and fair speeches. Does their faith line up with this book? They know how to parrot certain faith that is true. But are they living that faith? Does their life line up with their words? If they profess to believe that this Bible is right, that this is the perfect written word of God, are they correcting it? Are they adding to it? Are they ignoring it? And does their life line up with it? So they can fake uh, just men, righteousness. They can fake love. They can fake faith. What's the There's a fourth thing. What's the fourth thing they fake? 2 Peter 2. Turn to 2 Peter 2. I still believe Peter, uh, when you get to, by the time you get to 2 Peter, it's talking about different dispensations. So you've got to be careful with Peter when it comes to doctrine. But for instruction righteousness, there's amazing stuff in, in 1 and 2 Peter for instruction righteousness. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3. And though the and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Feigned words? Their words are fake. It always comes back to words. How do they deceive people? How do you think they deceive you into thinking they're righteous, they're just men? By their words. Now, I didn't read it, but when you go back to um, Luke, I don't know if I can't if it's the telling of Luke, when Luke says that they, they feign themselves just men. And you can have retelling of stories in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. And one of the stories, you see them, they really butter Jesus up. We know that thou teachest truth, and, and thou art true, and, and thou art you know, great, and, this, and they're puffing him up with their words. Okay. But they don't mean it. They're trying to trick him. They're trying to slip him up. They're trying to find a cause against him so they can take him, okay, and put him to death. 
But we read here that your words can be fake, brother says Christ. Words can be fake. Hmm. Well, how do we know true words from fake words? The Bible says, I'll go again, by good words and fair speeches deceiving the hearts of the simple. Good words and fair speeches. How do you keep from being deceived? Don't be simple. You know what simple means? Ignorant. Lacking knowledge. Lacking the truth. Where do you get the truth? Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. He's the way, the truth. Then he turns around and says, sanctify him through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. I'll praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. It's God's word. You need to stay in God's word, brother says Christ. You need to study it. You need to hide it in your heart and you need to live it. Make sure you're rightly dividing. Okay. Rightly dividing. So someone can fake. Real quick, let's go through this again. Someone can fake themselves to be just men. That was in Luke 20.20. 20. They can fake love. 2 Corinthians 6.6 6 and 1 Peter 1.22. They can fake faith. 1 Timothy 1.5 and 2 Timothy 1.5. He warns Timothy, a man in ministry, you know, there's men out there and women, but mainly for ministry. Don't invite anybody into ministry with fake faith that aren't really a brother or sister in Christ. Make sure they're indeed the sons of God. Okay? Make sure they're real. They're genuine. They're not wolves in sheep's clothing. Okay? They're not tares among the wheat. And your words can be fake. How do people feign it? Now, we read that in the Old Testament. All these different things that are going on in the Old Testament. What is it? They use these four things that we just mentioned to feign themselves as someone else. Their words, their love, their faith, and their righteousness. It's all fake. It's all feigned. It's not real. Well, brother, what do we do today? Like I said, sometimes it's hard to tell on the spot. But what I've learned is if you pray hard enough, uh, I don't make it like you're not praying enough, but you pray. You pray you stay in the Word of God, you keep hiding God's Word in your heart, you keep living it, and God will show them to you eventually. They'll start showing themselves. They'll slip up in their words. If you're online, I'm pointing over here online, they'll start slipping up in their words. They'll be like, oh, I'm one of you. And as you get from doctrine to doctrine, when you get to instruction or righteousness, when you're doing Bible studies, over time, they'll start saying things that go against this book. It'll just come out because the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. They can try to lie. They can try to lie. They can try to lie. And they put on this show, but eventually their heart comes out. They can't hold it back forever. You've got to be patient. And you've got to use spiritual discernment. And hold them accountable to this book. Okay. Turn back to Romans 12, 9. What about dissimulation? Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Turn to Romans 12, 9. 12, verse 9. The definition of dissimulation, the act of dissembling... You know, okay. Simulation, act of dissembling. A hiding under a false appearance. A feigning. There's the word feign. A feigning. False pretense. Hypocrisy. Dissimulation may be simply concealment of the, of the opinion, sentiments, or purpose. They're trying to hide their true purposes. But it includes also the assuming of a false or counterfeit appearance which conceals the real opinions or purpose. So you have feigning where they're just fake, but you have dissimulation where it takes a little step further and says that they have, they have a hidden agenda. They're, they're putting on the fake because they have a hidden agenda. And we read that when it came to feigning in the Old Testament. Did, did Jeroboam have a, an agenda? Yeah, he wanted to see his son to be healed, but he wasn't going to repent. There's a lot of people today, I want to go to heaven, but I ain't going to repent. Well, then you're not going to heaven. It's that simple. Unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. 
God's willing that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God saveth such that have a broken and contrite spirit. Right. And I'm reading now in, uh, was it Psalms 51? I put it on here when we sin. Psalms 51, you go through there. It's a good one to go through there. When you sin and you fail, Lord, you read through there. And it talks about, that's where it says, verse 17, the sacrifice of God, because it's talking about animal sacrifices. God's not really looking for those animal sacrifices in themselves. What he's looking at is the heart of the man doing the, that's coming for the, the sacrifice. Because the Levites would do the sacrifices, but the man coming to do sacrifices for his family. God would look at his heart, and the sacrifices of, to, of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou will not despise. Okay. Once again, you have counterfeits. It's fake, but this dissimulation is more for, hey, be careful. They have a hidden agenda. That woman that came over and said, I love you, but trying to pull us over to apostasy, trying to pull us over to a channel that the Robert Breaker, that's not a Bible believer, he's called Jesus, a, he called out Jesus a liar. He, he, he grabs books from outside the Bible. To, when the Bible doesn't prove what he wants to believe, he'll go outside the Bible to get what he wants because he's going to believe what he wants. He doesn't care what the Bible says. But he preaches a false gospel, only belief, head belief. They have the knowledge. What about repentance? Well, that's a work. What about prayer? What about asking God to save you? With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Unto salvation. It comes before salvation. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He teaches call means believe. No, call means ask. It's so easy to prove. It means ask. You're asking, in the Old Testament, when men began to call upon the name of the Lord, they began to asking God for help. What do we do here? What do we do there? One of the verses we read about calling on the Lord was, the guy was in a dungeon, and he called upon the Lord. He's in trouble. What's he doing? He's asking God for help. What does call mean? Ask. Okay. But her hidden agenda was that she was trying to get as many people away from the truth as possible. She was a servant of Satan. And you'll come across those people. I'm one of you, but they keep getting you over to apostasy. Doctrines of devils. Groups where sin is, like, they can get you to a group where, hey, we're one of you. And then they get you over to a group where sin abounds. They're very fleshly and worldly. Okay. They have hidden agendas. But Romans 12.9, let's get into this. Dissimulation. Romans 12.9. There's only two verses for dissimulation. Okay, words we only use twice. Romans 12, 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Let love be without dissimulation. What does that mean? You don't fake it to get something. You don't have a hidden agenda. Love's not supposed to have a hidden agenda. You see that out there in the world. These people, they love you, and, and they're really nice to you, and then you find out they want something. That's why they're loving you. That's why they're being nice to you. Because they want something. Those men that came to Jesus, they were buttering him up. Like, I love you. They're buttering him up. What? They want something. They have a hidden agenda. Be careful of flattering words. I warned a brother in Christ that's wanting to be in ministry and everything. I said, one of the things I had to learn was is you have to be careful. Everyone that pats you on the back isn't your friend. And all those that, are, that it seems like they're kicking a little dirt on you, they're not always your enemy. In other words, they're trying to correct you. People who are always trying to correct you, that doesn't necessarily mean they're your enemy because they're trying to correct you. And those that flatter you and pat you on the back all the time, not always your friend. You have to use spiritual discernment. The Word, the word of God, the Holy Spirit, spiritual discernment. But it says here, let love be without dissimulation. Don't fake love because you want something. It needs to be genuine. It needs to be real. It needs to be true. When you love your brothers and sisters in Christ, you need to do it because you actually love them. And if that means sacrifice that you have to give of yourself, then you give of yourself. Turn to Galatians chapter 2, 13. Galatians chapter 2, verse 13. Galatians chapter 2. After 2 Corinthians, 
Galatians chapter 2, here we go. Chapter 2, verse 13. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with them, with him. Talking about Paul. It's talking about the story about when Paul came to correct Peter, but Peter, Paul's telling the story about Peter, where he started when the Jews came, he would withdraw himself and act like those Gentiles were still dirty and heathens and unclean in his actions, not his words, in his actions. He would withdraw himself and act like they weren't saved and only hang out with the Jews. And then when the Jews left, he'd go back over to the Gentiles and say, hey, it's a, everything's good now, they're gone, everything's good. Now I can act normal. Now I can treat you like a brother or sister in Christ. And Paul saw that and, and Paul called him out on it. But that's what's going on here, okay? Paul was treating the Gentiles as if they couldn't get saved or weren't saved. He was going back under the Old Testament. Remember the whole story about the animals coming down and the sheep? Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And he says, not so, Lord, for nothing unclean is coming. And God says, what I have made clean, call not thou common. When a, Jew, a Gentile gets saved, we are adopted in and we are saved. We're all part of the body of Christ. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, Peter, you can now fellowship with these Gentiles because they are saved brothers and sisters in Christ. And what he was doing in the Old Testament, you weren't allowed to fellowship with the heathen. Okay, And you read that whole story, he gets called into a centurion's house, leads him to Christ and everything. But here he starts going back into the Old Testament and he starts acting and withdrawing himself. It says here, and the other Jews, when they saw Peter do this, the other Jews dissembled likewise with him. He set a bad example. Insomuch that Barnabas, here it is, Barnabas, also was carried away with their dissimulation. What was the dissimulation? They had a hidden agenda. They wanted to please these high, evidently these religious Jews, these high-level Jews are, are respecter of persons, as the Bible talks about. There were certain Jews there that Peter had a respecter of persons towards. And he wanted to please them more than pleasing God. And so he would separate himself. And he would just, he put on a show, feigning himself when they were around to act one way. And when they weren't around, he would act a different way. Okay? Dissimulation. Fake. He started acting fake. And Paul had to really get into his face. And sometimes we have to do that, brother says Christ. Sometimes we have to do that. So brother says Christ, for this, like I said, just was trying to do a word study. Just to kind of help you out a little bit, brother says Christ. Don't be fake. Look in your life. Lately, the Lord's been teaching me when I'm going through the Psalms, what King David would do is he'd always say, Lord, judge me. Then judge my enemies. Judge me first, Lord. Then judge my enemies. And that's what I've been having to do lately with my walk with the Lord. I keep saying, Lord, judge me first. Lord, what do I need to do? Am I having fake, fake righteousness or am I actually living it? That's why Paul said, examine whether you be in the faith. Are you living it? Are you living right in God's eyes? Are you doing things God's way? Or have you been deceived into doing things man's way? Hath God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? Are you starting to get trapped or deceived like all the hooks in you? We're going to be reading in the next week. We're going to read a, a chapter in, in Proverbs where it talks about the difference between God's wisdom and the world's, uh, world's wisdom. And it likens God's wisdom to a virgin. And it likens the world's wisdom to a harlot. And she gets all her hooks in you. Is, is the world getting its hooks in me and getting me to part from this book? Getting me to do things the world's way, the flesh's way, Satan's way, the three enemies? Or am I doing things God's way? Okay. This, first and foremost, before you get into this, it's not about me pointing the finger elsewhere. The first finger, finger that gets pointed, thumbs, <laughs> fingers, thumbs, is this man right here. God, judge me first. Do I line up with your book? And where I don't line up with your book, help me to get line up with your book. Get the wickedness and sin out. Get the worldliness out. Get the world's way out. Get doctrines of devils out. If I start, if you start swaying in a different, start believing things that are contrary to the Bible, get back to lining up with the Word of God. Okay, judge me first, Lord. Then judge my enemies. Okay, judge me first, Lord. Then my brothers and sisters in Christ. Then the enemy. Okay. Right? That's how it works with me. And that's I'm reading, I'm learning from the Bible. Okay? So brothers and sisters in Christ, please, please, this whole study, take it to heart. And remember, you need, in these last days, you need to have your guard up. 
Put on the whole armor of God. You need that shield of faith. You need to have that sword. Gird up your loins. Remember what girding up your loins is? You gird up your loins to go to work. You gird up your loins to go to war. We fight for the truth. We live the truth. We need to do both. Okay? You gird up your loins with truth, and it's that sword, that double-edged sword that cuts both ways. Lord, judge me first. Then judge my brother says Christ in the world. Judge me for it's a sword that goes both it cuts both ways. Okay? So, brothers and sisters in Christ, please, please, please make sure you line up with the book. Make sure you're staying in the Word of God daily. Make sure you're praying that God opens the scriptures to you and you're praying to God about your day-to-day -day walk with the Lord. And don't be that simpleton. Good words and fair speech is deceiving the hearts of the simple. Don't be that simple. I come across those professing Christians out there all, all the time and they're very ignorant of Scripture. With their words, they know how to copy with their, whoever they follow, that respect of persons, that lowercase g God. They can parrot what he said, but they don't actually know the Word of God for themselves. Make sure you're reading the Word of God every day. Uh, try to go through the Bible two or three times a year, the whole Bible, eventually. But I always tell people who are newly saved, start with the Pauline Epistles, uh, Proverbs and Psalms, the Pauline Epistles, I throw John in there, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John in there. I say, get, get those down really good. Uh, every once in a while, I occasionally go into the Gospels and reading the Gospels and stuff like that. And like I said, the whole Bible is important, but eventually you get to the point where you should be getting through this whole book two to three times a year, Brother Jesus Christ. And hiding in your heart and talking to the Lord about it. Don't be deceived. Okay? There's a lot of fakes and frauds out there. And their whole goal is they're servants of Satan. And their number one goal, brother, says Christ, is to mess you up. Their, their, number, I'm sorry, their number one goal is to put as many roadblocks in front of the lost world as possible. To try to prevent them from getting saved. But if you know your Bible as I know your Bible, if someone dies in unbelief, it's on them. It's 100% on them. If they truly want the truth, God will send it to them. He'll send someone to preach the truth to them. They'll come across the King James Bible. They'll come across a, a gospel tract. Okay? They'll come across something. God will lead them to the truth if they want the truth. But the number one job of these Satanists, servants of Satan, is they're putting out as many roadblocks to try to prevent people from getting saved. Then when someone does get saved, their second job is to mess that person up when it comes to doctrine, when it comes to truth, and when it comes to sin and wickedness. They try to entice you and tempt you, and they do everything they can to mess you up as a, as a child of God. Brother says Christ, be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil going around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And then it goes in the verse of him transforming, uh, Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. No marvel that his ministers should also be transformed in the ministers of righteousness. But he goes around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Put on the whole armor of God. Helmet for a hope of salvation. Made, uh, you know, being in Christ made us unto us redemption. We're supposed to look, be looking for that blessed hope with the life that we're living. That's what that helmet is. It's not about salvation when we, got, when we first got saved. It's about salvation from this life. We're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope with the life we're living. That's what that helmet for a hope of salvation. We find out that it's the hope of salvation. Breastplate of righteousness. We represent Jesus Christ. We're ambassadors for Jesus Christ. His righteousness is imputed to us. We're supposed to be a light for Je of Jesus Christ to the world. His light is supposed to shine through us. And I've talked about girding up your loins with truth, the sword. Above all, putting on the shield of faith. You're able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. When they try to come through and start pretending the fake faith, fake love, fake righteousness, fake words, you're catching on that shield of faith. You believe in God's word. You're hiding in your heart. You know God's word. Your feet are shod with the preparation of peace. Always praying and always watching. There's two things you're watching, brothers and sisters. Uh, be sober, be vigilant. You're always watching out. Spiritual discernment, which is what we're talking about today. False converts, fake people that are fake. You're always got to be on the lookout. You have your guard out. But we're also looking for that blessed hope with the life that we're living. Judge me first, Lord. So you're, you're, the first thing you're looking for is that blessed hope through the life that you're living for Jesus Christ. Secondly, you're keeping your eye out for the enemy. 
and keeping your shield up and keeping that sword ready to be on guard when that enemy comes around. And they start trying to fake and deceive you. And you're like, thus saith the Lord. That's what Jesus did. When Satan came and tried to trick him up, he'd quote half scriptures, half lies. But Jesus, being God, of course, he knew the scriptures. It is written. It is written. It is written. He called him out to be the fake and fraud that he was. And that's what we have to do, brothers and Christ. This is what matters. This is the foundation. We rightly divide. Be careful not to add to it, not to subtract from it. And like I said, rightly divide. Dispensations. Okay, dispensational. That being said, brothers and Christ, we're going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching. I hope this has exhorted you and encouraged you to get back in the Word of God and get back to living for Him and making sure that you're not one of those feigned people. You want to be real. I want to be real for the Lord. And I want to serve Him with my, all my heart with His God's Word. And how do you serve God with all your heart? By hiding all His Word in your heart and living it. Right? So I will see you guys in the next video and thank you for watching.